Okay, rockets, rockets, and more rockets. We started out this series about six months ago and have been building ever bigger, more powerful, and more sophisticated rocket engines since that point. In the first video, I covered the basic principles behind a rocket engine, giving a way to visualize the process that's going on inside of the rocket to produce the reactive thrust. I then gave you a formula for a very effective and simple to use sugar-based, or in our case, Zorbitol-based solid rocket propellant. We mixed it up, we placed it into rocket tubes, and went outside and tested them, and they worked. Subsequent to that, we did a couple of videos on rocket ignition systems. How do you get the candle lit? In the last video, we kicked things up a notch, and I gave you the formula for a very high-performance composite rocket propellant based on an HTPB rubber and ammonium chlorate formulation. It's effectively the same formula that was used to produce the solid rocket boosters for the space shuttle. We then went ahead and packed that inside of motor tubes, went outside, and demonstrated them. And we got some really exciting results. So if you're interested in this, you might want to take a look at that video. We had a lot of fun with that. Today, we're going to kick things up another notch, and we're going to get into hybrid rocket engines. Now, when I talk about hybrid rocket engines, what we're talking about is the mixing of solid and liquid in the combustion chamber to produce the propellant for the rocket. What's exciting about them is that they marry the advantages of solid rocket engines and liquid rocket engines and avoid a lot of the downsides of either type of engine. Now, one of the big advantages of a solid rocket engine is simplicity. You mix up the fuel and the oxidizer at the same time, place it inside of a motor tube like this, stick a nozzle in one side like that, you can put a fuse in there and run, and you've got a very successful rocket engine, as we demonstrated. This is so simple that this technology has been around for at least a thousand years and probably a lot longer than that. At the other extreme, you have liquid rocket engines. Arguably, at this point, the most sophisticated liquid rocket engine out there is SpaceX's Raptor engine. Beautiful piece of engineering, and if you're interested in that, take a look at the video that was done a couple of months ago by the Everyday Astronaut. He does a video that gives you an idea of how they developed it, the plumbing, the engineering behind the engine. It's an interesting video. What makes the rocket engines so complicated, the liquid rocket engines, is not what's going on in the combustion chamber or the nozzle. It's the pumps. The Raptor engine runs a combustion chamber pressure of 300 bar or 300 atmospheres. And so the pumps that force the liquid into the chamber have to produce a substantially higher pressure than that to get the liquid in, probably as high as 400 bar. They have to do so in large volumes with cryogenic liquids and they have to remain light. As a matter of fact, SpaceX got a special patent on a new type of stainless steel just to allow the oxygen side of their closed system to survive those kinds of conditions. So unless you've got billions of dollars for the kind of engineering involved, a full liquid rocket engine is just about beyond any kind of amateur's capabilities. What's nice about the hybrid rocket engine is that because the fuel is located in the combustion chamber already, you get to eliminate one set of pumps. Now, if you were still using, say, liquid oxygen or concentrated hydrogen peroxide as the liquid, you would need pumps. But most of the people that are working with hybrid rocket engines are using liquefied nitrous oxide, which is contained in a pressure ves vessel at a sufficient pressure to actually force the liquid into the combustion chamber. So you eliminate all of the pumps, and that makes it a lot more approachable. Another disadvantage of a liquid rocket engine is the fact that the combustion chamber not only has to resist pressure, but has to resist the very high temperature of the exhaust gases for the full duration of the burn. So it either has to be made out of very exotic materials, have ablative liners, or as they do, 
flow large quantities of the oxidizer or the fuel around the combustion chamber to cool it and keep it from melting. The way a solid rocket engine is manufactured is that there is a central burn core or hole and that's where the burn begins and progresses outward through the propellant grain toward the outside of the rocket motor. And so the propellant itself actually acts as an insulator to keep the outside cool. That's the same thing that happens in a hybrid rocket engine where the fuel acts as an insulator for the outer tube. So the tube can be manufactured out of something that's strong, it has to resist pressure, but it can be made out of composites that are lightweight, easy to handle, and less expensive. So it's a big advantage of the hybrid rocket engine. Now one of the big reasons why liquid rocket engines are used has to do with what's called specific impulse or performance. This is a unitless number, it's a ratio that gives an idea of the performance of a rocket propellant. And so if you have a specific impulse of say 100, that means that if you take say one pound of propellant, you will get 100 pounds of thrust out of that propellant for one second. Or if your propellant massed say a kilogram, it would produce a thrust equal to the weight of 100 kilograms for one second. The original sugar rocket formula that we gave you has a typical specific impulse of maybe 130, 140. The more advanced composite propellant that we showed you in the last video has a specific impulse of around 220. The Raptor engine, which is typical of most liquid-fueled engines, has a specific impulse of 330. So if you want to get your ass to Mars, you're going to use a liquid rocket engine. The hybrid rocket engine has a specific impulse typically of around 300. So although not quite as good as a full liquid rocket engine, it's better than any existing solid rocket propellants. Another major advantage of the liquid rocket and the hybrid rocket over the composite rocket is safety. When you mix up the composite rocket fuel, you're putting the oxidizer and the fuel all together in a nearly sealed container you've got a very dangerous setup here. So when we build these composite rocket engines, we build them and we use them. If we were going to try to store these things, we would put them outdoors in a steel bunker because they are dangerous. Both the liquid rocket engine and the hybrid rocket engine don't mix these reactants together until they're in the combustion chamber, which makes them a lot safer. So you can put the liquid oxidizer, the oxygen in your living room, you can put the liquid methane in your dining room, and that's a lot safer than taking a big flammable tube of composite rocket propellant and putting it next to the stove in your kitchen. It's safer. Now the fuel that can be used for a hybrid rocket engine can be anything that burns. It can be rubber, it can be plastic, you can 3D print it, and interestingly, there's a few videos out there, Applied Science did one a couple of years ago, where they took a clear polycarbonate tube and blasted some gaseous oxygen in one side and produced a blowtorch going out the other side. It's kind of neat because you can actually see the flame front in the clear plastic tube as it's eating its way through the polycarbonate tube. However, the most exciting state-of-the-art fuel for a hybrid rocket engine. It has the highest thermal efficiency, the highest specific impulse is, drum roll, wax, paraffin, candle wax. That's it. It's lightweight, it's very easy to obtain, extremely inexpensive, relatively easy to form into fuel grains, and it's non-toxic. So if you build up an engine of whatever size and pack it with wax, you have something as dangerous as a birthday candle. You can store it, you can transport it, and it's safe, and that's a nice thing. Now you might be wondering, with all of these advantages, why you don't hear about hybrid rocket engines all the time. There is commercial development being done on these engines, and university groups are working on them. But despite everything that I've said about its simplicity, there still are some serious engineering challenges. And we have spent a fair amount of time and money overcoming many of these challenges and have built some very powerful hybrid rocket engines. We're gonna share that with you. We're going to give you links to the components and show you exactly how we did that. So you can duplicate what we've done or have a great head start if you wanna build your own hybrid rocket engines. So to get started, let's talk about the oxidizer. Okay, so let's do nitrous, or I should say, let's talk about nitrous. 
Now, the major advantage of the nitrous oxide is the fact that because it's contained under pressure inside of this pressure vessel, we can use that pressure to drive the liquid into the combustion chamber and eliminate the pumps. But you can also stay away from very toxic, very hazardous materials like concentrated hydrogen peroxide, which is another oxidizer. You can also stay away from cryogenic liquid oxygen that requires a cryostat, like our liquid nitrogen cryostat for storage. Nitrous oxide remains a liquid at room temperature at reasonable pressures, and so it can be contained in lightweight aluminum or composite pressure vessels. The other thing about this is we're going to refer to nitrous oxide often shorthand as nitrous. And the nitrous that you're going to be using in any kind of a rocket application is called racing nitrous. What that means is that they have intentionally spiked or denatured this nitrous oxide with some sulfur dioxide. Unlike medical grade or food grade nitrous oxide, which can be used to get high, this material, because it's incompatible with human consumption, is not regulated. So you can go ahead to a nearby welding supply house and you can pick up very large steel containers that hold a large volume of nitrous oxide. And with a few fittings and some hose, you can create a filling station that allows you to refill these small tanks yourself at your garage or at your shop, which is a lot cheaper and a lot more convenient than going to a speed shop to get this filled. Another big advantage of nitrous oxide is because of the racing industry, the components, the tanks, the valves, the fittings, are all compatible and widely available. You can get most of these things locally. You can certainly get this stuff on Amazon. Now, for you metric people out there, you're gonna to have to forgive me because I'm gonna be using primarily imperial numbers here simply because most of this stuff is sold and marketed in the United States. Now, nitrous oxide, because it's both a liquid and a gas, is not, uh, it, you're not able to determine the level or the amount of nitrous oxide you have by using the pressure gauge. Unlike a typical nitrogen or argon tank where the pressure indicates how much you've got left in the tank, this valve, this gauge will not change pressure as long as you have some liquid in the tank. And so the only way to determine how much you have is based on weight. So if you look at the label of these tanks, this is a five pound capacity tank it will give you three numbers. The first is the empty weight of the tank, including the valve. The other number is the full weight, and the net number or the capacity is how much liquid nitrous oxide it will contain. Now the actual volume inside of this tank is larger than the volume of five pounds of liquid nitrous oxide or liquid nitrous. The reason for that is you always wanna have some vapor above the liquid. If you were to fill this completely up with liquid and there's no room for expansion, even a very small increase in temperature can lead to a catastrophic increase in pressure. So you do not want to overfill these tanks. If you want more nitrous oxide, get a bigger tank. This is a five pound capacity tank. That's a 10 pound capacity tank. Generally, they go up to 20 pounds and all the way down to a tiny little one pound bottle that you can slip into a thigh pocket. So if you're in a race and you're interested in cheating and adding a little nitrous, that's how you do it. Now, because nitrous oxide is both a vapor and a liquid, it is the vapor that's pushing the liquid out of the tank. And so the pressure gauge will indicate how much force is pushing that liquid out. And so the pressure gauge on a typical nitrous oxide tank at room temperature, let's say 20 degrees centigrade or 70 degrees Fahrenheit, will be around 700 to 750 PSI, or about five megapascal. That can be changed dramatically with small changes in temperature. If we warm this tank as little as 15 degrees centigrade or 30 degrees Fahrenheit, we can push the pressure all the way up to about 1200 PSI. And a lot of racers will take advantage of that because it will allow you a greater pressure head to force the liquid through a given set of plumbing and give you higher performance. Now, in order to do that, racers will actually use these flexible silicone strap heaters that wrap around the tank and will warm it to bring the pressure up to its maximum. We could have done that, but I took advantage of just commandeering our sous vide cooker and used this to create a regulated temperature bath. So after we fill these tanks, we can bring them to exactly the same temperature and therefore pressure so we get repeatable, reliable filling and reliable testing. Now, 
I'm going to go ahead later and I'm going to show you exactly how to fill one of these tanks and how to do that safely. But there's other fittings here that I want to show you about. The valve on top here is not the same as the valve you would have on a nitrogen or an argon tank, where it just simply allows the vapor to come up through the valve that's located on the top of the tank. Because we want the vapor to push the liquid out, there is actually a siphon or a pickup tube that runs down the center of this tank and then very near the bottom takes a 30 degree bend, a little hockey stick bend. And by industry standards, that bend is opposite the label and in line with the in-out port here. So in a racing application, you would mount this tank on its side like this at 30 degrees so that the fill tube goes all the way down to the bottom and then angles down to the very bottom corner here so that you can get that very last few drops of goodness out during a race. It's also important in a racing application that when you mount the tank, the bottom of the tank is toward the rear of the vehicle so that when you are doing a pass and you're under g-forces, the liquid is forced against the bottom of the tank. You don't want to mount it like this, where the g-forces could actually push the liquid away from the pickup tube. It's the same sort of issue that aerobatic pilots have with their fuel supply. Depending on position and g-forces, you don't want to be picking up mixtures of vapor and liquid. In our situation, because we are going to be using not every last drop in here, we're just going to put this in a vertical orientation. Now, the other thing you'll see here is this fitting, this flare fitting. It's called an AN fitting, and it comes all the way from a little AN3 with about a three millimeter opening all the way up to an AN10 for a very large opening to carry a lot of volume of fluid. These are flare fittings, and unlike a typical pipe thread, which is tapered, thicker at the top, thinner at the bottom, when you screw this into a female thread, a mating thread in here, this will get tighter and tighter, and the threads themselves actually do the sealing of the, of the um, interface. So you'll use a thread compound or a Teflon tape to get a very good seal here. In the case of an AN or a flare fitting, the nut on the end of your fittings actually is used just to apply a force to push the male and the female components together. It's similar to the same way a regulator works in a gas tank, like a nitrogen tank. The nut doesn't seal anything. It applies pressure to push the male into the female receptacle and provide a metal-to-metal -metal seal, which is excellent. The reason for that is you can connect and disconnect this hundreds of times without damaging the interface. And you also avoid putting any kind of debris in here that could potentially get into the valve or into the ports. Now, the other sort of issue about this sort of tank is that when you're using a nitrous oxide tank in our kind of an application, remember that the pressure that you see in the gauge is not the pressure that's going to be driving the liquid through the engine. What's going to drive the pressure or drive the liquid is the difference between the pressure in the tank and the pressure in the combustion chamber. So we too are going to want to run this to the highest pressure that we can so that we can run reasonable combustion chamber pressures as well as have enough to get the liquid into the system. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is show you how to safely fill one of these nitrous containers. So what I'm going to do is bring this over to a scale, and I'm going to turn on the scale and let it zero. And now we're going to weigh this. And as you can see, we've got about 11.6 pounds in the tank right now. So we're going to want to add 1.4 pounds to this tank. Remember that number, 1.4 pounds. Now, if I was simply to connect this up and depend on the height of liquid here to push this into the tank, we'd be here all day. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to cool this tank here, lower its vapor pressure, and therefore the greater vapor pressure in here will force the liquid in much more quickly. And to cool this, we're going to take advantage of a piece of equipment that we used in a couple of previous videos. So let me show you how that works. Now over here, I have a chest freezer that we've used to provide a continuous supply of very cold water. By plugging this thing in about 12 hours once a week, we can maintain in here a mixture of both 50% water and ice, and that 160 liters of liquid that we have in here will remain frozen, but also will contain enough water that we can pull out exactly zero degree water or 32 degree Fahrenheit water whenever we want. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead 
and fill this container here with some water that we're going to use to cool off the tank. So we'll just dip this in here and start going. This is a very useful piece of equipment because having very, very cold water and not depending on going to grab some ice cubes or thinking it's relatively cold, you know that the temperature of the water has to be exactly at freezing because you always have an equilibrium between the ice and the water. And the insulation in this thing is remarkable because of the fact that it's made to run at very low powers to maintain freezing temperatures. Just to maintain this water-ice interface requires very little energy. It's very, very convenient to do. So we're going to bring over this container to the scale. So we're going to put the pot on here. We're going to add the weight of the tank like this. Then I'm going to connect up this filler hose, but I'm only going to do so finger tight. I'm not going to make this very tight, and you'll see why, just, to, just so it approximates the two surfaces. Then what we're going to do, this valve is still closed here. I'm going to go ahead, and I'm going to open the tank to the nitrous like this. Then what I'm going to do is, using this ball valve, I'm going to slowly open this, and if you listen, you'll hear a little bit of hissing coming from this joint that I haven't snugged down. Now the reason for that is I'm, I'm pushing out all the atmospheric air and potentially any humidity in the air so we don't get any water in there. Now I'm going to snug this down so it doesn't leak. Then I'm going to fully open the ball valve like this. And now we're going to get a weight. 39 or 30 yeah 39.9 pounds so we want to go and we want to add 1.4 pounds to this so we're going to end up wanting to go to 42.3 pounds 42.3 pounds so i'm going to go ahead and open this valve and if you listen you hear a little bit of hiss as the liquid begins to enter the tank you may not hear it it's pretty subtle but slowly, over time, this will begin to fill. OK, so we've got this to 41.2. That's good enough. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how you disconnect this. And it's important to do this in this order to be safe. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to close the valve to the tank like this. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to close the valve to the supply tank. Turn this off. and then close the ball valve. Now, if I took the wrench and I disconnected this at, point, at this point, I'd end up getting a cryogenic burn because there's liquid in this line. So that's what this purge ball valve is for. I'm going to turn this, and you're going to hear a bit of a loud hiss. So anybody with headphones, this gets a little bit loud. OK, now that this is decompressed, I can disconnect the tank. So now I'm going to take the tank out. We've got a nice full tank of nitrous. I'm going to dry this off and bring it back over here. Now, from this point, once we open this valve, the liquid would be pushed out through the AN fitting here and through this stainless steel braided rubber hose. This hose has got the braid simply to allow it to resist the very high pressures of the nitrous oxide and will feed the liquid into these electronically actu actuated solenoids. Now, in a racing application, you will have two solenoids, a small one that will allow you to add additional gasoline to the engine when you're adding the additional oxidizer. This can be relatively small because it's got to work against a relatively low pressure head. However, the valve that has to hold back as much as 1200 PSI of nitrous oxide and open quickly has to have a very large spring and a very high powered coil in order to operate. This valve here will require between 30 and 40 amps at about 13 volts in order to open. 
So we have over here a battery bank with some lithium ion batteries that provides sufficient amount of power to be able to control this valve. Once we open this valve, after as little as 10 seconds, this solenoid will get noticeably warm. As you can imagine, this is not a continuous duty valve. But certainly 10 seconds or so is enough for a racing, a drag race, hopefully, and for us to test the hybrid rocket engines. So we don't really care that we can only run this for a short period of time. Once this opens, the liquid then is allowed to travel down out of the valve and into the plumbing here. Now what you see is some compression fittings in what are called your lock systems or your lock laboratory, stainless steel, high pressure, low leak compression fittings. These things will then lead the liquid all the way through out to the end and into the engine. What you'll also notice is this small brass fitting located here. This is a one-way check valve. If an engine test went completely pear-shaped and the engine got plugged up and reached extremely high pressures, the engine will rupture long before this valve will allow a retrograde flow of hot gases or liquid back into the tank. It's a safety feature. Another thing that you'll notice is that there is a T-piece here and a lower capacity check valve to a low pressure oxygen line. This is necessary for the starting sequence for the engine and we'll get into that a little bit later. Now, when the fluid moves out through the end of this tube, we obviously have to control the flow. We can't just let it go wild into the engine because you need a certain quantity of nitrous oxide depending on the size of the engine, the size of the throat of the nozzle, the type of fuel you're using. And the problem is you can't restrict that flow with this valve or with any of the plumbing upstream. Because if you do, you will get a large pressure drop that occurs at that point and can cause vaporization of the high pressure liquid nitrous oxide, causing bubbles. And you get an irregular burn of the propellant inside of the engine. And if the pressure drop is large enough, you can actually cause the liquid nitrous oxide to freeze and block the lines. So the restriction has to be limited to the entrance port inside of the engine. That's the only way to do that. And so to do that, you will use a, a, a nozzle that has a limited orifice or aperture that will control that flow. Now, there is a second issue that has to be dealt with when you're dealing with a hybrid rocket engine. It's one of the biggest problems. And that is, for the most part, except for maybe hypergolic fuels, liquids and solids don't burn. Now, you might say you're crazy. Gasoline is a liquid and it burns not as a liquid. Even liquid oxygen will not support combustion unless you vaporize it because you need that rarefied mixture to allow the intermixing of the molecules and the reaction of the molecules for the burn. So when the liquid comes out of the tank at a high pressure and as a stream of liquid, you need to break that liquid up into billions of tiny little droplets to give it the surface area that allows it to rapidly vaporize. And you have to spread that vapor or that liquid transitioning into vapor into the fuel to allow it to liquefy and to vaporize, mix and react. And all of that has to happen evenly through the entire rocket chamber within a couple of milliseconds. That's tough. And that's why you need a very special nozzle application in order to be able to achieve that. Now, the nozzles that I have located here are just a small sample of the different types of nozzles that we've worked with. I've used them for some of the jet engine videos that we've done, and I've bought some more for this application as well. These things are widely available from industrial supply houses for a variety of different purposes. You can get them for spray painting and printing. You can get them for cleaning. You can get them for cooling and fire suppression. They produce a variety of different flow patterns and different types of atomization. The simplest method to get these is just to go to a local supply house. We get most of our parts from McMaster Car here in the United States. And my wife constantly jokes about the fact that McMaster Carr's favorite customers are the United States and tech ingredients. We order a lot of stuff from them. And the nozzles that we obtained for this represent a simple orifice. This is the simplest type of nozzle that you could use. It's just a limiting port that limits the flow. It is a lousy choice for a hybrid rocket engine because the liquid that comes out of here comes out almost like a laser beam and would rock it all the way down through the center core of the engine and right out the rocket nozzle and wouldn't interact with the fuel. So it's not a good choice. A better choice is to use what's called a fogging nozzle. 
This is also a limiting orifice, as you can see, but they've placed a little U-shaped stainless steel pin right in front of the spray. So with kinetic energy, the liquid will hit the pin and atomize into a very fine fog. The problem with that type of nozzle, though, is that that rather isolated and delicate stainless steel loop that's placed in front of there will not survive the conditions inside of the engine. After one pass, we were able to actually burn off the stainless steel loop. Not a good choice. Another option is what's called an internal swirl nozzle. If you look on the inside of this nozzle over here, you'll see that there's a little central port and then around the periphery of the nozzle are three larger ports that are at an angle. They create a rotational velocity inside of the nozzle so that when the liquid comes out of the nozzle, because of centrifugal force, it tends to spread out into a cone. That's better. The problem with that is it doesn't provide really good atomization. You can get it in a variety of different port sizes and even different spray angles. But because there is no kinetic impact, you don't break up the droplets. You don't get the fine droplet uh, atomization that will give you the, the evaporation. What we discovered is that the very best nozzle for this application is called a spiral nozzle, as you can see examples over here. The spiral nozzle also has variable choices for the size of the aperture. But what they do is they form a sort of a screw shape or a spiral shape that will peel off the edges of the spray as it's coming out of the nozzle and send it into sort of a snail pattern or a spirograph type of pattern producing a cone that moves outward. Nice distribution of location and because of the kinetic impact with that screw will create a very good uh, atomization of the liquid. They also come in a variety of angles. As you can see here, this has a rather coarse screw, coarse spiral, and pr produce a 60 degree angle of dispersion. This finer screw actually produces a 120 degree angle of dispersion, which is what you want. This is a better choice. There's also what's called solid cone and hollow cone. These two nozzles over here do not allow any of the spray that comes out of the orifice to go past the end of the uh, spray nozzle or the spiral nozzle. So they have a hollow cone. They produce a distribution like this, but the inside of the cone is empty. That's better because you don't want anything being wasted being sent straight up through the cone or through the, the engine or through the uh, fuel grain. This example over here does not complete the spiral and has an opening at the end. So this is a full cone design. That's not what you want. You'll also notice that it comes in both brass and in stainless steel. Inside of the engine, because within a millisecond or so, this entire nozzle is completely surrounded with cryogenic liquid nitrous oxide. The brass will survive this very well. This is perfectly compatible with the engine. And at $10 a piece versus $60 a piece is a far better choice. So now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take this outside with our setup and our tank, and I'm gonna demonstrate the different types of spray patterns from these nozzles and show you how we set this up for the engine. Come on, let's go. Okay, so I've hooked up the electrical and we have the nitrous tank down below, the valve is open. We are ready to fire, and so on three, this is going to be the simple orifice, the limiting orifice. Three, two, one, zero. Okay, so now I've changed this over to the simple fogging nozzle with the little pin located in the aperture. Three, two, one. Okay, now I've set this up with one of the internal swirl nozzles on three. Three, two, one, zero. All right, now I have the narrow angle spiral nozzle in here, and you'll take a look at the kind of pattern it produces. On three. Three, two, one, zero. Now you see that produced a very uneven sort of spray. It was spraying the uh, nitrous oxide off even toward the cameras and actually bent this slightly. That produces a very inhomogeneous type of distribution of 
nitrous oxide inside the cylinder. So we definitely don't want to use this one. Okay, now we have the wide distribution spiral nozzle in here, and you'll see the difference. Three, two, one, zero. So we get a better distribution, but we still get somewhat of an asymmetrical kind of output from here. So now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you how we finally fixed this problem and got a really good spray. And this is what's done in a lot of hybrid rocket engines. They don't put the wax or the fuel right up to this stop here and put the nozzle inside of the, the uh, fuel grain, simply because the kinetic energy of the nitrous or the liquid coming out is so energetic, it will actually destroy, it would actually eat up the uh, fuel grains and cause them to break up into particles. So they put a spacer in here to help give it another kinetic impact to break up the droplets even finer and also to protect the fuel grain from the kinetic impact of the liquid. So I'm gonna put that adapter on now. Now for this test, what I did is I left the same nozzle you saw in the previous test. It is the hollow cone, wide angle, spiral nozzle. But in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna place an aluminum ring around here that will provide another kinetic impact, even better breakup of droplets, and at the same time protect the fuel grain from the impact of the fuel. So I have a little strap here that I'm gonna to use to attach this with. And we're gonna simply put this back down over the uh, manifold that holds everything in place and screw this on nice and tight. Good. All right, if you're ready for the test, on three. Three, two, one, zero. That is what you want to see. So just to give you an idea how much power the nitrous oxide can add to combustion, I'm going to do a little demonstration here where I have a few charcoal briquettes that I've had burning here for about five or ten minutes. And we've got this thing up to the point where now I'm going to add the nitrous oxide. So on three, two, one, zero, I'm going to fire the nitrous in here and you're going to take a look and see what this does. Three, two, one, zero. Pretty impressive, huh? You can imagine what this might, this kind of flow of oxidizer does in a small tube the size of one of our small rocket engines. The kind of fury that's going on inside of there produces a tremendous amount of thrust. In the next video, what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how we fabricated the wax grains for this kind of fuel. It's a little bit tricky, and there are a couple of little techniques I can show you to help you to make a very perfect fuel grain for the inside of the engine. In addition, the very high temperature oxidative environment inside of the hybrid rocket engine will completely destroy a plastic rocket nozzle within about one second. And so I'm gonna show you how to machine, how to fabricate very high temperature nozzles from graphite, and they work very, very well. There are some special tricks and techniques to use for that. Now, I wanna warn you, be careful. This obviously includes a lot of heat and a lot of power, and you wanna stay safe. But if you like the kind of stuff that we're doing here, please subscribe to the channel, give us a thumbs up, and if you have any questions or wanna make any kind of a comment, I read all of the comments and I try to answer as many questions as possible. So hopefully you found this interesting. Stick with us as we continually progress toward the engines, and hopefully you'll stay safe. Have a very good evening, and we'll see you soon. Good night.